So first of all, welcome everyone. This is the third session the first of the Fanoa Tax Essentials webinar. Um, last time that you, many of you are returning, which is great to see, uh, the last time you guys joined us, it was to do with tax number validation. One of the topics in that webinar was what the importance is about validating tax IDs when it comes to specifically digital reporting requirements. So this week, we're going to deep dive headfirst into digital reporting requirements in Portugal specifically. So we're going to this is probably one of our first more narrow topics, specifically on Portugal. And on stage with me, we've got Rob, um, who you may have heard is going to be fielding our questions in the background. So if you have any tough questions, please send them in. Um, Selen, who has our in-house experts specifically relating to Portugal. We have several experts for digital reporting and e-invoicing, but Selen is our go-to when it comes to Portugal. And we're happy to have her on stage with us to walk us through the requirements today. And our solutions uh, architect, David Pevitz, will of course be joining us as from the previous sessions. What we've heard is that you do want to see more practical examples of how these solutions are being solved for by us. So once again, we'll return and we'll um, pre present something that, that we have built in-house. Without further further ado, there's our three beautiful faces. Um, what is the agenda for today? The agenda for today is number one, do a quick recap of what we mean by digital reporting requirements. Number two, then go into the deep dive and have a look at the upcoming changes, uh, specifically relating to Portugal, and then also present us a brief solution overview. And in more detail, what are we going to cover specifically relating to Portugal? We're going to look into e-invoicing, that buzzword that everybody keeps on using, and we're going to try and elaborate what we actually mean by that. We're going to look into certified billing software, something that's quite particular to Portugal. We're then going to have a look at digital reporting requirements, which is the, the meat of the topic, and then specifically touch upon document content requirements. That's the agenda for today. If you have any questions throughout this session, please ask them in the chat. The, the, the chat box is at the bottom of your screen. Ask away. If you see something you like or you hear something you like, give us a thumbs up. If you're shocked by any of the content that we share, give us a shock. So the emojis are there to be used. Um, and yeah, without further, further ado, I hope you enjoy the session. Um, one last comment for me. The session is relevant for those of you, for those of you on the call who are already present in Portugal. This is great. You're probably aware of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. For those of you who are not yet present in Portugal, but interested about how it is run, how the digital reporting requirements this is definitely for you. And those who are dialing in out of curiosity, we're, we're happy for you to extend to, that you're planning to extend your knowledge and hope that we are able to answer some of the questions you have for us today. So. Selin, over to you. Can you tell us what on earth we mean when we talk about digital reporting requirements? What 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 is this? What is this space? Yeah, yeah, good question. And I think it's important to set the stage by defining this term because terminology in this space can be really complex. Uh, to simplify things, uh, when we say digital reporting requirements, we are talking about uh, obligations that require taxpayers to submit their tax relevant data to the tax authority on a transactional basis. The important part here is uh, the tax authorities ask for a transaction by transaction visibility. So if um, there's a requirement to submit a transactional data, then there is a digital reporting requirement, regardless of what the tax authority calls this. They can uh, introduce uh, digital reporting requirements through e-invoicing, real-time reporting, safety, or ET listings. So there can be different uh, forms of shapes, but the goal is this uh, is the same transactional data submission to the tax authority uh, electronically, basically. That's, that's really helpful. I think the, the importance of getting this terminology right, as we will see, is I use the word e-invoicing for absolutely everything, much, much to the disappointment of my teams and uh, the frustration of selling as well as our other I, I just call the space invoicing, but the terminology is really important in this in this area. So, getting that right and what we mean is, is important. Um, so, what about digital reporting environments in in Portugal and what I call all the time e invoicing? Where am I wrong? So, tell me yeah. Right so, me. so in the Portuguese context, um, it can be quite confusing because there is an estatura legislation which deals with B two B and B two C transactions. And yet it doesn't require issuance of invoices electronically. We will come to that point. But when we say invoicing uh, for Portugal, we are talking about B2G transactions, uh, mainly because it is mandatory for 
large taxpayers in Portugal to generate electronic invoices for B2G transactions. And what they need to do is uh, basically generating a structured electronic format and submitting it to the platform that is operated by SBOP. But if you don't, if you are not a large taxpayer and if you don't have B2G transactions, you don't need to worry about this. And uh, one important thing is that uh, this obligation was supposed to apply for SMEs in Portugal uh, starting from this year. However, um, let's say announced this year as well, uh, they are going to postpone this requirement for SMEs. Got it. So whenever I come up to and ask you about e-invoicing in Portugal, your mind is instantly drawn to B2G and large payer transactions. Okay. What I, that's not what I mean when I come up to ask you. What I really mean is that it's probably something that's on this next slide. It's... Um, this certified billing software, what, what's, is this special to Portugal? What is it, first of all? So certified, by the way, certified billing software is again, not related to e-voicing, but uh, okay. if taxpayers uh, operate, so either established taxpayers or non-resident taxpayers that are established for VET purposes, if they are meeting the threshold criteria of 50,000 euros annually, then they have to either get certification for their billing software or they need to acquire a certified uh, billing software solution. Uh, so the important point here is to point out that even if you are not an established company in Portugal, if you are a non-resident business that is registered for VAT purposes in Portugal, then you need to also comply with this rule. We're going to see throughout this uh, presentation uh, there, there are many requirements for non-residents. Uh, it is not only applicable to domestic operators uh, in that sense. Got it. How difficult, can, can I ask you, how difficult is this to obtain? What do you need to do to be certified? Just as a high yeah. level, sorry. Yeah, good question. It is not as simple because there are different technical requirements. Uh, also, there are other. Uh, there are some legal requirements. Mainly, the technical ones are relating to uh, um, being able to create SAFT files and being able to export SAFT files uh, to be able to digitally sign uh, all the documents generated and uh, assign content requirements. So the tax authority looks at uh, billing softwares as a part of the certification process uh, to assess if they can. Uh, comply with all these technical requirements. And once you uh, obtain this certification, it is not enough. Once, um, once in two years, the signature certif the certificate is expired. So once in two years, you need to go through another process um, to get a signing certificate. Got it. This, this, this looks like, you know, usually if, um... These requirements, I would typically expect to be targeting local local businesses that you have to provide the um, that you have to provide a certified billing software in order to be able to issue these kind of things. What's interesting that here is in Portugal, this is non-residents that are also registered for, for taxes or VAT specifically within within Portugal. That's that's unusual. Um, as yes. These and and I guess this is the trend is to move in this direction anyway. So this what Portugal is doing is maybe maybe unusual right now, but give us five, 10 years, this is not, this is not necessarily. Um... Exactly. This is a new trend. Uh, and usually this type of obligations first um, comes into play and then they affect large taxpayers uh, in the domestic operating domestic space. And then it expands by um, the threshold this decrease, which was the case in Portugal. And then they went one step further by requiring non-resident uh, businesses uh, to comply with the same requirements. Got it. Okay. Then what's what's the what, what's then digital reporting when it comes to, if it's not e-invoicing and that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> if it's not certified billing software, what do we mean by digital reporting requirements? In so so what we mean is submission of uh, transactional data to the tax authority. We are going to walk through three different requirements. The first one is relating to submission of invoice data to the tax authority. Uh, it is required for uh, all uh, businesses that are um, having commercial activities in Portugal. And in order to submit invoice data, they have two options. They can either submit it through real-time reporting so for each and every transaction, 
or at the end of the month, they can generate a billing softy file and submit this uh, the, the next month by the eighth day of next month. So there are two options for this specific requirement and billing softy uh, certified billing softwares uh, so have to generate billing software because this is a certification requirement. That's why it is like the easiest solution. However, we see that at the end of the month, uh, generating billing softy and submitting it might trigger more errors. So sometimes it's preferable by taxpayers to use real-time reporting. And it is specifically relevant for marketplaces and underlying suppliers because it is so hard for them to compile all the data uh, for billing softy that becomes a challenge and real-time reporting can be a simpler uh, option in this case. Celine, very quickly, and Eiko, can I ask um, very quickly on this one? I recall that the real-time reporting was indeed more suitable for marketplaces locally. Yeah. I don't recall what the underlying practical reason was exactly. You're saying it's easier to compile the data in real-time. Can you just maybe give like a practical example or, or what the background there is? I can talk to it as well if, if you need me to ah, sell cool, from, from Yeah, yeah you can go experience. first. Yeah. From my past experiences that usually for, for marketplaces dealing with this, the smaller to medium sized businesses, um, this requirement of having to file a SAFT, you have to remember to do it. And the problem, and so this is where you need to keep me honest, the problem there is if you have any B2B transactions on those platforms, if you forget to do this stuff, um, you're actually, you're, you're ruining that B2B experience as well. So that, that forgetful, that it's, it's, remember, these are small businesses your marketplace is typically dealing with in my, my past lives was dealing with smaller, smaller businesses. So these guys would forget rather than, um, so the preference from a lot of these players was we don't want people to file it. We would rather there was an automated solution that would connect directly and report the transactions in real time. It saved a lot of uh, on tickets and complaints from specifically from platforms where have an element of also a B2B. So then is what about, is, does that, is that, does that ring true yes. from what you've, your experience as well? Exactly, exactly. That is exactly the case. And I see uh, another comment here. Uh, yeah, exactly. Javier, you are saying that Softy is due on the 5th from 2023. That is correct. But yeah, as Isabel explained, uh, the tax authority has extended the deadline for specifically this year from uh, 5th day to 8th. So maybe uh, that's the reason why. Otherwise, yes, you were right. It was like an extension in December, I think. And moving on to maybe the accounting softy. So there are two separate softy files and the second one is accounting softy, which is uh, supposed to be submitted on demand currently. Uh, and the data elements of accounting softy is different than billing softy. Billing softy has like billing uh, transactions, but accounting softy also has general uh, general ledger entries and it is submitted annually. And there is an upcoming change relating to this, which we will mention in the upcoming changes part later on. Um, and the third digital reporting requirement that we want to mention is communicating transport document data, basically reporting transport document data to the tax authority. Uh, there, this is very similar to available requirements in different countries. And in Portugal, it is required for movement of goods, similar to many other jurisdictions, but it is also required when uh, transporting uh, your own goods bit, uh, bit between your warehouses. So that's why uh, it is important to mention here, if you don't communicate transport document data with the tax authority and get um, uh, an approval, you can't uh, start moving your goods within the territory of Portugal. Well, wow, so it, it, you don't need a sale in order to have the, this, this requirement pop up in Portugal. Exactly. It applies okay. even if you're moving your own stock. And can I ask you another silly question, just to just to reiterate, perhaps for, for me, um, the if you do a billing SAFT, so if you report monthly, can you just multiply that twelve times for each month and compile the accounting SAFT? Because of course it'll it has to be the same info, right? <laughs> no, it is it is not. It is a different uh, type yeah. of information. An accounting SAFT doesn't have billing information. It has general ledger entries, okay. so the content is different. So it wouldn't work, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess what they say about it all being standard is, um, it's okay, I'm, I'm, I will not pass it. The wise lie. <laughs> okay. 
And then, and then right. document contents. Can you talk us through, this is, this is all the stuff around the QR codes. I don't know how to pronounce the middle one. And then um, what other documents are affected? Yes. Um, so on top of certified billing software, digital reporting requirements, document content is also regulated. Uh, there are two main components other than regular um, invoice data, let's say. The first one is a QR code which is required to be present on all documents generated through certified billing software. Uh, and the second requirement is at code. This is a unique document code. It is generated, um, it consists of two uh, main elements, a validation code and a sequential number. The validation code is received from the tax authority per document type. So for, uh, this unique code, uh, uh, is generated after receiving a validation code from the tax authority per different documents and then using sequential number. And it is uh, the scope is different than QR code because, as I said, QR code is only necessary if the documents are generated through certified billing software, but at could is required not only for certified billing software generated documents, but also like cash register generated documents, POS uh, solutions as well. And another important point is that these are not only required for invoices, but all fiscally relevant documents, meaning uh, transport documents, purchase orders, receipts um, as well. And if, if I remember, you remember you telling me this, or maybe it was you or David that said that the at could has to appear, or this, this reference number has to appear on those documents um, twice, right? Can you can you just if for those so, for those maybe in, the, in in listening in that are trying to build this, just a reminder: where do you need to put this? Exactly. So, art code has to appear right before the QR code. Um, but QR, let's start from QR code. Maybe QR code can either appear in the first page or the last page. But art okay. code code must appear right before the QR code, and art code must be present on each. Uh, page, meaning if you have a document that uh, has like three pages, you need to put three at good codes in, on each page. Got it. Thanks. I think it's just calling out that I know some folks may be considering <laughs> yeah, doing this in-house. So just a reminder that to, to look into legislation and get the exact citations correctly on each page. All right. What about what's changing in Portugal? Can you talk us through some of the timelines that I know we've got coming up? What are the things that you think we should know? Yes, like in, in any other country uh, where you have digital reporting requirements, the only constant thing is the change. Uh, the tax authority uh, was planning to uh, require SMEs to generate B2G invoices starting from this year. But recently, like three weeks ago, they announced that they will extend the deadline uh, for SMEs to comply with this requirement, but we don't have a date yet. It's coming. The second thing is relating to integrity and authenticity requirements. Taxpayers must um, ensure integrity and authenticity of documents that they are issuing today. But what will change is that there will be only two ways to ensure integrity and authenticity after January 2024. They can either apply qualified electronic signature or seals, or they can use EDI. So it's becoming a stricter obligation. The third change is relating to accounting safety submission. Currently, it's on demand. However, from 2024, it is uh, becoming a, a, a file that taxpayers need to actively submit. And the first submission deadline will be 2025 because it is relating to the year of 2024, and this is generated annually. And the fourth change is VAT in the digital age. This is um, proposing groundbreaking changes, basically, in the EU, not only in Portugal, but of course, uh, as a European member state, uh, Portugal is also uh, impacted by the proposed changes. VIDA um, proposes changes with different timelines. There are so many changes and like there are different timelines. And the first changes that are relevant for digital reporting are proposed to go live for 2024, and it is relating to generating invoices, and only structured electronic invoices will be considered invoices in the EU, and there will be um, digital reporting requirements for um, latest 2028. So 
all member states need to introduce e-moising that is coupled with digital reporting requirements uh, latest by 2028 if VIDA can pass as it is today. Well, okay. so I think it's a question from folks in, on VIDA specifically. Um, we don't have something, we don't yet have something planned to talk about this, but but Celine, it sounds from your saying, and I know you're trying to cut it a little bit short, but that's a topic on it in on itself, mm -hmm. at least I think. If you think that we should do something uh, on this particular, specific to VIDA, let us know in the thumbs up or in the chat. But um, for now, I think we can we can steam steam rule ahead. Uh, these and by the way, these are just the four changes, right? There, there's protect. There's usually more that come in countries, but these are the four key ones that you we decide to highlight, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. What about uh, so coming back from the future and into the current and into present and the past? What are the problems that you've been hearing about from um, in in your day to day work, specifically working with companies? Um, there are four main challenges. The first one is relating to data consistency. So now that the tax authorities have so much data that is coming from you, they have great visibility over uh, each taxpayer's um, transactions. They have great overview. However, taxpayers are finding it really hard to compile all their transactions because they are using maybe different um, sources or vendors sometimes. So mm -hmm. data consistency is becoming a problem for taxpayers. Uh, they don't have a single overview of what is happening, uh, but the tax authority has a better visibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, another challenge, the second one is country specific integration. So each and every country requires, first of all, different scope, different data content requirements. There are different types of connections uh, with the tax authority. Technical specifications are different. So it is really hard to uh, stay on top and manage all these differences. If you're operating in more than uh, one jurisdiction, it becomes really hard. And the third uh, challenge is relating to maintenance of systems and data, uh, because the constant thing is um, change in this type of landscapes. Because what we see is after having introduced the requirements, the tax authorities are changing um, the data type that they are asking for. They ask for more data, they change rules, they update technical schemas or schematron rules that are validations on the data. So uh, taxpayers need to have great monitoring in place to keep up with this ever-changing rules. The fourth thing uh, that we are talking here as a challenge is that the impact of uh, this type of requirements on, is extending uh, on because these are starting to affect different business processes. What happens is that the tax authority introduces invoicing or invoice data reporting, real-time reporting invoice uh, obligations that starts affecting AR, AP processes to begin with. But then they also introduce requirements like electronic transport documents that can have impact on logistics processes. Or they introduce electronic payrolls that has impact on HR process. So as uh, we move Fast forward and adoption of technology by the tax authorities, the impact of this type of regulations uh, on business processes is becoming uh, bigger and bigger. This is, I mean, this is really interesting because usually this is constrained to the headaches for fintech, tax tech. Let's just put that in the same bucket and maybe tax and accounting teams. But actually, what you're saying is on that last one, um, it's interesting that it's now going beyond just the tax impacts and now protection, particularly tax documentation or transport documentation. If you don't get the right documents, you can't even, you shouldn't be shipping, you shouldn't be shipping things between even your warehouses, which is really, it feels kind of restrictive in a way, but that's just one example of how these requirements are now, I would say, adversely impacting some business processes if not, not conducted correctly. Exactly. And this is just, for example, we are now talking about Portugal specifically today. Mm -hmm. If you are operating in five jurisdictions where you have digital reporting requirements, this becomes a bigger challenge because this is just one country that has so many obligations. And then there's another one, and none of them have 
a similar way of regulating even within the EU. And that's the whole purpose of VITA, for example. They're yeah. trying to harmonize rules and rules are different even within the country per transaction type sometimes. What do you, what do you mean by that? Isn't like the different types of flows, B2B, B2G, like you said, B2G is e-invoicing, B2B in some cases with trying to put somebody over 50,000 is certified billing software, then B2C might be a different fiscalization, right? Of some sort. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in this case, it's not completely different between B2B, B2C, but there are countries where you see even that being different. So yeah, rules are fragmented. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's not been made easy for, for business in this space, for sure. Um, which kind of leads us, without all doom and gloom on this particular slide, it's clear there are a lot of things to work through. But maybe um, if, David, can you come and show us our, a, a ray of hope that there is ways to solve for this and maybe show how we've done it and how others can get inspiration of what perhaps if they're considering in-house what they can do. Yeah, definitely. And uh, thank you both for your presentation so far. Um, so what we would focus in this solution overview would be essentially what are the components that Celine also mentioned briefly uh, in, in the presentation so far um, of the process that you need to comply with in order to be uh, in, in line with the legislation in Portugal when it comes to real-time uh, data reporting to the government, uh, also the document issuance and the product safeties. And then we'll walk you over just what piece of this does Fono Automate, how does it look like from a user perspective, um, and what are the, the benefits essentially of, um, of, of our automation approach. And so if you think of the process um, end to end, you would start from the basics, which is your data, which would be data on the supplier, a customer, so their names, addresses, text numbers, uh, and then the transactional details, such as line items, EIN codes for physical products, tax rates, uh, amounts, uh, and so on, any discounts if applicable. So this would be the data that you would readily have available in, in your ERP billing system or a mix of these, uh, or if you have a homegrown system. So you would have the data on your side, but then the complexity comes in that the government in Portugal, they expect you to send a, an XML file uh, to them electronically. And this XML file will have to be, will be also UK dependent. So between imports, exports, credit notes, uh, different exemption uh, scenarios where you have, let's say, exports of something or, import, or, or imports cross-border, you would also have to configure different codification in this XML file in order, to, in order for it to go through with the government. Finally, once you are able to construct these XML files, you would have to also have a certified connection with the, with the Portuguese government that Celine mentioned. And this is a fairly, can be a lengthy process in terms of the admin process that you go, that you go, you go through to get access to it. And also you would need to go through audit processes for all the document types that you are um, issuing and communicating with the government. So for instance, if you're adding a new flow or you're adding, let's say, transportation documents to the mix, you would have to go through an audit process with the government in order for them to verify that you can actually um, legally do this in, in a production uh, environment effectively uh, and communicate data to them. Finally, once you establish a connection with the government and you have the XML files ready, you would have to know how to interpret the response that you're getting from the government, be it for successful cases or fail cases. And especially the interesting uh, topics are on the fail cases where you would have to understand what went wrong and how to resolve the issue. And obviously the, the language that you will get from the government will be in Portuguese. Uh, and the same thing will happen with any other jurisdiction. So it'll be a local um, local error codification effect that you would need to translate and harmonize on your side and then configure. Finally, if you, when you do that, you would have to also then create a local government document that will contain both the data that you have on your side, but also piece of information that you would get throughout this reporting process. Uh, so for instance, the PDS would contain the QR code, um, the act to code, which is like an, a new one. Um, and uh, the, essentially you would have to make sure that your invoice numbers are sequential, uh, that the documents will have to be digitally signed, so there are a lot of nuances around the process of actually creating these documents if you, wanna, if you want them to be compliant. Uh, and then finally, we have the safety files, which are very popular in Portugal, that will either be periodic or it can be an annual, um, a, a basically annual audit uh, safety file that government can also ask, ask, ask you to create. And from our experience, uh, we've seen cases with, with our customers who previously haven't used the real-time reporting flow. They might have issues with missing invoices or missing, let's say, uh, ATCUD codes in some of the transactions that will trigger errors and that it would have to do manual uh, fixing of these files uh, as they file them. Uh, and since deadlines are fairly tight uh, after the month end, uh, this can be also a stressful um, situation internally. Dave, so this can is I ask, 
Can mm-hmm. I ask you something? How much of this is what you're explain, explaining? How much of this is kind of relevant to all? To, to, how much of this is generic, and what of, which of this is very Portugal specific? For example, if you're taking different countries into into consideration, is this is this very standard? Is in fifty yeah, thousand so overview? Yes, it's a great question. So if you look at this this structure, maybe ignoring SAFTI, which is maybe a little bit more Portugal, Poland, Romania specific, but if yeah. you ignore periodic SAFTI files, these, this process is essentially the same at a high level in every jurisdiction, but although being the same in uh, at, a, at a high level, it's going to be very country specific in terms of how these XML files or JSON files have to be structured. Uh, how do you get connection with the government? How do you read their responses? And again, here we have also issues with, with the local language, understanding what they're saying from, from an API point of view when they return an error or a success. And then also making sure that you are maintaining um, and keeping in, in line with all the changes that are happening uh, across the board, which is then also very complex in case you are introducing new business flows, new business lines, or anything that would trigger a new type of a transaction, either uh, something that gets cross-border or if you're expanding to B2C versus B2B or you go into go B2G. Um, so the, this will grow in, in complexity effectively with the number of countries and, and complexity of your internal um, business model. Uh, and will in any case be about, you know, they, it will be changing constantly. So the ACTUD codes are fairly recent uh, and Celine mentioned a couple of like new uh, changes that are, that are happening. So this is always a living um, living problem essentially never goes away and uh, they, they try to make it more complicated uh, globally now. No, not deliberately. I think <laughs> maybe maybe the intention is to simplify things, but unfortunately for a lot of companies, that's not the case. It, 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 it does, it will require some additional thought from their point of view. Sorry, and by the way, I interrupted yeah. the apologies. No, no worries. Yeah, so this is a kind of like high level overview of like what's happening in Portugal and the similar comparison can be done with any country. It's just with a lot of country specific nuances within each of these uh, the boxes. Um, and we can go now into what how we handle this. And our goal is effectively to automate all of these green boxes that you can see here, starting from your data. I'll let just echo open up the slide. Yeah, so if, if you look at the what we do, uh, effectively we start from being able to receive your data, which can come from multiple data sources. So it's very common, especially for enterprise companies, that they would not have all of their information uh, in the one in a single source of truth. So they might have different ERPs because they acquired companies or they inherited something previously, so they haven't migrated everything to one central system. Or you might have internal homegrown systems that you're mixing uh, with ERPs. Um, so for now, since we work through APIs, we can receive data from basically any mix of data sources. And the data points that we that are required for, for e-invoicing or real-time reporting um, are usually fairly readily available on, on your side, so that's not really an issue. And once we receive them, um, then we effectively do a lot of preventative data validation steps uh, and, and also data communication. So I think, Aiko, you can switch to the, to the whole slide so we can walk through the process. Right. So once we receive the data from you, we would first validate whether we received all the mandatory data points, whether um, there are any mathematical errors in, in, the, in the calculation, as some countries might have different rounding rules, for instance, in terms of how many decimals and how do you find these decimals points. Um, so we would try to prevent any kind of issues before even we send the file to the government. And then we would restructure the data that's going to be in the basic format when we, once we receive it from your side and we would restructure it to the compliant XML file, depending on the use case in, in, uh, in, in uh, stake. So if it's an import versus export or local sale, it'll be a different configuration effectively. Once we get the file ready, we would send it electronically to the government through our certified connections that we have across the, across the globe. And we'll then have to reach the government response. And what we do here is we essentially standardize the response that we can get from different governments, be it for successful transactions, where we would then pick up a confirmation code from the government or any kind of additional data. Like in Portugal, we would have the QR code code content, uh, the ADCUD code, um, and the, the similar um, similar codification can be found across the world globe, be it in EMEA or, or Latin America. Um, if it's a successful transaction, then we can also create a local compliant document for that sale um, and, uh, and have, it, have our customers uh, take them and put them in their own internal ERP and, and communicate to their end clients. So they fully control the flow and they use Fonoa only as a translation layer uh, to, to comply with e-invoicing wherever they're operating. And then finally, in a more, more interesting case, uh, if something goes wrong, 
then we what we are doing is effectively that we are standardizing responses that we're getting from different governments when it comes to failures. And we standardize the codification of how do you resolve these issues, what are the root causes, um, to minimize the time that you need to spend on debugging, be it on the operational side or, or technical side. I don't know, or Celine, if you wanted to uh, add anything or if there's anything else we can we can show around here. No, I think that's that's really from my side. It's that's really helpful. I don't know if others have got questions specifically coming from the the, the audience. I think if they join us, um, what part of the billing process actually need to be certified? Did you, and that's just conscious of our time. I think we might need to return to that because we've got two minutes to wind up the the, the webinar unless Rob takes it. Um, David, I don't have anything to add to this. What what I was what I, my takeaway is that, look, it's complicated. The requirements are different. The overarching flow seems to be similar. But the good news is that it is possible to, to build for Portugal. Selim once told me that there, the number of um, certified providers within Portugal is close to about 2,000, 3,000. Let's put it this way, nice round numbers. About 3,000 people have managed to build this internally. Now, but however, if you look at that and the escape of the whole market, that's actually not that many. But the real problem is, is actually doing this as a multinational is doing it across various different markets because the requirements of Port in Portugal right now are so specific that it doesn't, it, it's, a cha it's, it's difficult to get this to build this from the ground up. Um, if you want to know how difficult that is, you can speak to David uh, specifically and Selin of, because that's essentially what they've been trying to do for various markets. Selin, would, anything to add? No, uh, as a closing, I would like to thank you, thank everyone for joining, but especially for Isabel, who is also responding to questions. So special thanks to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so here's four very quick takeaways. Um, if you had to summarize this down. So number one, there's multiple requirements. They're varying scope. Uh, personal takeaway for me, don't call it always e-invoicing. Um, save save some nerves for my for my colleagues. Call it call it digital reporting requirements as an umbrella term. Um, there's specific complexities when it comes to Portugal, such as QR codes, ATCUD, billing software, transfer, trans, transportation documents. Um, there are changes. Um, of course, the only thing that's constant is change. Very cliche, but very true for for Portugal specifically that there are kind of coming changes, and that and they're not only just Vida. They're very specific uh, to the. Um, authentication requirements, right? The, the various different, exactly. the, the different expansion scope to SMEs for the for e invoicing coming into play. Uh, but as David showed, you are able to standardize for Portugal. If you have any questions that haven't been answered, if um, we we do have a practice of coming back to you. If you are very interested in this topic as well, to go and do your own explorations, here are some resources that you can go to. We can share these with you if these are of interest. Our two favorites right now going through selling is the Portugal e-invoicing and DRR guide. That's the very top one with the star. There also is a really great webinar for another webinar from TLG presented on the e-fatura system from somebody from the Portuguese tax authority. So if you want to deep dive into this, uh, you want to pursue this rabbit hole further, there is a lot of information across over here. These are the, some of the sources that we like. So if you're interested in this, um, I'm happy to share this with you. But for now, thank you so much for tuning in once again and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks everyone, this was fun. How did you get on, Rob? I tried my best, but I'm never as good as Celine and you are. Um, <laughs> but we will definitely, so just for everyone that posted uh, questions that I couldn't answer uh, right now, we will follow up with you. We receive all of the actual questions that are posted, so we can always uh, run them by Celine or Eiko or our expert team uh, and follow up with you after. So not to worry if you didn't get your answer. We'll, we'll circle back. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Well done. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.